So, after doing, looking at the construction of all the, the infrastructure that we have just discussed, the, the, the feeds in terms of paddocks and the structures, the sheds and so on, then you consider introducing animals, okay? So, we are still systematic in the way we are approaching our enterprise, isn't it? Don't start with animals, then go to constructions. Don't start with animals, then look for a site where you're going to put your farm. So start with, obviously you must have identified the source of the animals, but don't bring them uh, on your piece of land before you do or whatever we have discussed has been completed. So now let's look at introducing stock. It's advisable to start with indigenous breeds, why do you think we, we should start with our local breeds? The explanation is, is there. It's very important that you become uh, uh, you become that person that uh, is, is very critical in the way you spend or in the way you manage your farm. And one way under which you can achieve that is by trying to minimize on risks, okay? If you're still new in this kind of enterprise, definitely indigenous breeds will do better for you. Why? Because their management is not as very restrictive and uh, detailed as the exotic breeds, okay? So, if you are still new in this enterprise, consider starting with indigenous breeds, provided you feed them well, and you also take good care of them in terms of meeting their health requirements. Then, um, that is introducing stock and starting with indigenous uh, breeds. Then, when you feel that you have now attained a level of, of, uh, of specialization in terms of managing your stock, then uh, you can now consider improving this genetic base that you have by looking at uh, these uh, three strategies. The first one is by selecting within your indigenous stock be a farmer that uh, practices record, uh, record keeping because these records are now going to help you in selecting the best animals out of your stock. Okay? Record performance in terms of new production. So, uh, then the, the second strategy is by carrying out crossbreeding. Crossbreeding uh, helps us benefit from what we call hybrid vigor. You're introducing, you're crossing your indigenous breed with a highly performing exotic breed, okay? Where the average, product, uh, average milk production on the farm is now going to be, uh, is now going to be improved by the introduction of this better performing breed. Then the third way, uh, and crossbreeding could be natural, using a bull, or you could use artificial insemination, okay? Then uh, you could also consider replacing the, uh, replacing the entire indigenous stock by introducing pure exotic breeds. So, uh, we are having a, uh, a point here, they're telling us that the quickest way to improve milk yield by genetic improvement is by Crossbreeding with a breed that has higher genetic potential to produce milk. So, when introducing your breed, or when looking into the different considerations, ensure that you select a breed based on these factors. The first one is market 
conditions. What are those quality factors that your clients are looking out for? Because you might be this farmer that is producing in bulk, but when your protein and fat content of your milk is low, and that will call for reduced demand for your milk. So always do a market survey, analyze those quality factors that might affect selling your milk. So market conditions, the current and future market conditions are very important. The population might currently need uh, milk that is high in protein, and tomorrow it could be the reverse, where they might need, now need fat, high fat content. Or they might just need um, volumes of milk and a reduction or lev low levels of protein and fat. So you always have to be on the same page with, with uh, what your uh, customers need. So then adaptability is also important. Don't be that farmer that looks at success of your neighbor, that neighbor having a particular breed and you think that that success might be coped and brought onto your farm. The management system might be different and you might end up introducing a breed that requires high management capabilities that you might not have developed yet. So ensure that adaptability is another factor that you, you consider before introducing a particular breed. Feed resources, we discussed them. I shall not need uh, more discussion. Uh, breeding qualities. Breeding qualities, here uh, there is a combination of reproductive performance and, uh, and, and fertility included, where they're telling us that consider um, calving intervals. Remember, an entrepreneur needs or wants a calf every year. So you always have to look out for, for, for cattle that are able to give you a calf every year. Don't look for rheumatic animals that, that whose calving intervals go beyond a year. And then um, case of calving, sorry, ease of calving. Look out for animals that don't need uh, to be supported when giving birth. So animals should have that trait of easy calving. Uh, vigor of the calf, you should look out for animals that produce lovely calves. Birth weights are also important, and so on. Popularity of the breed. Yes, this can be looked at uh, or understood or appreciated in different ways. Currently, the most popular dairy breed is what? Is the Frisian. So, I don't know for, uh, whether farmers that are rearing a fusion are actually benefiting out of it or not. You need to do your research. But as we speak, the fusion is the most common breed. Though I, as a person, I would prefer jerseys for so many reasons. More so to do with productivity and, and management. So after looking at those factors, that are going to guide you in selecting your animals, then we have different ways of developing our foundation stock. And uh, the ways, the different ways are looking at which animals, which, which category of animals or age of animals you might consider introducing. You might consider introducing cows, heifers, or calves. All those different ages of animals have their pros and cons. The discussion will majorly concentrate on, 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 on the cow, okay, the mature animal. And uh, the advantages of, of starting your farm with cows, or as cow, uh, starting with cows as your foundation store, are several. And one of them is they will give you a short return on your investment. Remember, you could be that lucky person that introduces cows or purchases cows that are already in a calf. Whereby, uh, these animals with just uh, mere staying on your farm for a few months, they'll actually start calving down. So, 
in that way you have an indirect benefit. If you procured your animal at maybe two million, at least at the end of the day, you might um, look at it as someone that bought the animal at maybe 1.5 million. If you now transfer the other cost to, to the calf. So the return on investment of using cows as your foundation store is short, and that way the farmer is able to earn in the shortest time possible. Their productivity can also be determined from records. Remember, buy animals from farmers who are practicing record keeping. Don't buy animals based on what you're told. Buy animals based on what the records are saying. So, and because these are cows, they already have a proven performance record. So consider that. The size of their others can also be used as uh, a way of determining uh, productivity. Just the size could also, like, the size of the other has a direct link to uh, production and productivity of, of the animal. So, um, we have a, a criteria that we, 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 we use when identifying that particular cow. Remember we have said these cows have a number of advantages. So what are those factors that you look at when choosing that particular cow? Okay? Those factors. So one of them is the production. You always have to select high yielding uh, animals. Conformation. Confirmation of, of, of the animal is very important in terms of uh, the body. And we are told that uh, the cow should have a well balanced appearance with the ideal body shape of a dairy cow, which is triangular. Okay? We shall look at the triangular shape just in, in a short while. And then the pin bones should be slightly lower than the hip bones. This has, uh, uh, has an effect on the Calvin ease that we just talked about. Pin bones being slightly lower than the hip bones. And then it should have steep foot. It should have a steep foot angle as this requires less hoof trimming and provides better mobility and greater longevity. We shall look at it. And uh, you should uh, uh, prevent buying cows that hook in, that have hooks in and toes out, because this increases stress on their feet and legs, and may have increased trauma to the rear other as they walk. We shall see that in a second. This is the triangular shape of a dairy cow. Okay triangular shape of a dairy cow that we need to look out for. It is triangular in shape, okay? Triangular in shape. An animal that is, 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 re is relevant for beef production has a rectangular shape, has a box, a uh, rectangular shape, okay? This one has a triangular shape. Reason being, we need a lot of space here to accommodate a lot of a lot of forage, because the more it feeds, the more it will produce milk. Okay. So this is the triangular shape that I'm talking about. We also relatively thinner neck. The, the the neck of the beef animal is wider compared to to the dairy animal. It is triangular with a thinner neck compared to the beef animal. And we have been told that the hip bones uh, should be higher compared to the pin bones. Now, <coughs> for though I'm sure all of us are familiar with cows, isn't it? There are, there are, there are these two bones. There is the pin bone and the hip bone. Okay. These two bones, the beak and the tail head and the, and the hip bone. So this area should be slightly 
at a certain angle, but not pointing up, like you're seeing here. Pins that are higher than hooks <coughs> are not good, okay? If this area is lower and this one is higher, this one is not good anymore because this one, in most cases, we need uh, to be supported when giving back, okay? Because the calf is moving upwards. Now, this is what we need. This is the idea. Slide slope between the hooks and pins. Okay? These are the pins and the hooks. There is a slide slope. Okay? Easy movement of the car at Calvin. Okay? Then we have severe slope between hooks and pins. Okay? We don't like this kind of animal. Neither do we like the first one. This is the idea when you're selecting. Your we also talked about the foot, the, the foot angle, and we are saying the middle part is the recommended one, with the reasons that you see. Uh, the foot angle is steeper than the illustration in the video, might interfere with the proper cushioning effect of the first line and the foot and this stress on the joint. We still have the picture of the triangle shape. Okay? This uh, animal eats a lot. Okay? And because it eats a lot, we do not want a lot of pressure put on the legs. That's why we are saying that we don't want this kind of, of, of food or the other one because this kind, kind of feed predisposes this animal to unnecessary pressure because this pressure comes from. The, the, this this uh, heavy part of the stomach, or the belly, and also the weight of the other. Okay, this middle foot uh, is positioned so well, and uh, the cushioning by the, the by the pastern, this part is uh, is the is, is the preferred one. They are telling us that proper cushioning effect of the pastern and of the pastern and could put undue stress on the joints. Imagine when this animal is satisfied and producing a lot of milk. Okay? So this kind of, of, of joint will have a lot of pressure being um, inserted on it by the weight from above. Likewise with the other one. And and we are also told that yeah in the first picture this distance being closer to to the to the ground predisposes this animal to these other challenges like abscesses, foot rot, and other things. So we need this kind of food. Um, then we also discussed or looked at this. Hooked in legs and toe out. The hooked in legs, these are the hooks, okay? And these hooks are inwards, okay? And toe out. The toes are out, okay? This is the preferred type of uh, conformation of, of the legs, okay? This is what we need. Remember, for the same reasons, the weight of the body and the other will really put a lot of pressure on those kinds of legs. So the lifespan or longevity of that kind of kind of animal is is short. So the other, the other is a very important structure of the animal. The reasons being because we discussed these reasons earlier, it is the factory, isn't it? So. When, when, uh, we, when we are scoring uh, dairy animals, the other itself has a score of 40%. Actually, it, is, it scores the highest in relation to other factors that are looked at. The other scores the highest because it is the most important structure on the body. Because this is what uh, produces the milk, which milk gives you the money on a daily basis. 
So you have to look at the other depth. Other depth is very critical. Teat placement is very important. And in addition to that, temperament of the animal you're choosing is very important because it affects secretion of milk. The animal should be docile, should be friendly. Age at which uh, the, the, at which you're you purchasing this animal is also important. And then the health condition of the animals. So, discussing others, the hopes, this is the ideal, at least closer to the hawks. We don't want others that are deep up, okay? And then others that are, why, why are people so interested? So interested in, eh? Are they unmotivated? Are they, the interests unmotivated? Eh? So, uh, others, this, this, this evaluation in selecting an animal is very important. The hawk, at least we need to have an other that is slightly above the hawks, okay? But not this or that. And then we also talked about the teeth. The teeth, these, <coughs> these are not required the ones that are pointing in, or outwards, or, but with, this is the ideal. The ideal because it is easy to, eh, to palpate when, for example, if you're, 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 you're doing hand milking, okay? Or even machine milking, okay? So, you also have to look at that. I will have a few videos at the end of the session if they still, if we still have time. Uh, we have we have just discussed what you need to consider if you're going in for cows. Now let's look at the heifers briefly. Um, this can be based on the cows in the herd from which they are, they are chosen or selected. Good cows will always give you good offsprings, and milk production is a heritable trait. The trait of milk production is highly heritable, and it is passed on from the parents to their offsprings. If you are choosing heifers from high-producing animals, definitely you have uh, good producers as 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 heifers. Okay. Then confirmation. Um, if you don't have those records, they're telling us that you can also base on records. Uh, sorry, confirmation is used when records are lacking, but here, little emph emphasis is placed on the other, unless it contains excess fatty tissue. You know, heifers are still young, okay? And you, you might be choosing heifers that hardly have grown up others, okay? So, then there, if you don't have the records, like in the first instance, then you have to look at body conformation. So looking out for the positioning of the, the, the legs or the limbs, the triangular shape that we have just discussed. Then if you're not going in for heifers and you're going in for calves, then uh, there are also factors that you need to look out for. And uh, most of the people go in for calves because there could be a challenge with startup capital. But cows being uh, low in cost, in procurement cost, doesn't mean that you don't want to face challenges on the way. And those are the challenges, those are some of the challenges that you might face as you rear them, which include uh, costs of raising them are higher compared to the first two types, heifers and cows. And the returns on investment are longer because these calves might need to rear them, rear them for over a period of a year before they start. They actually, before even they, 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 they reach that age of breeding. So actually, you might end up requiring over one and a half years or to two years before you start earning out of them. Then um, calves are highly susceptible, susceptible to diseases 
like uh, septicemia, uh, pneumonia, and, and, and so forth. And it is also hard to determine performance of these animals at that age. Okay? Then, uh, having looked at the, the, the females, then now let's look at the, the bull. The bull is a very, very important member of your herd. Do you have reasons as to why it is very important? And by the way, it is the most hectic activity in terms of selecting which animals you are going to rear on the farm. Bulls, bulls are highly demanding and their selection is very, very competitive and you have to be that person that is going to uh, to check out even the slightest detail in terms of its performance. So, selecting bulls is very important because these bulls contribute 50% uh, of the genetic makeup or composition of your herd. Assuming you have one bull on the farm and you have over 25 animals and these animals are being served by that one bull. Each, each female that is being served by the same bull, the offspring that comes out of it has a 50% composition of the genetic composition of the bull. So ensure that you select the best bull for your herd. Otherwise you are going to, to mess up your enterprise from day one in terms of production and productivity. So um, the bull to be selected can be evaluated using uh, the criteria below. Uh, the first criteria is a self-evaluation criteria. We are self-evaluating the bull by uh, using the proven SIA method. And a SIA whose genetic credentials have been established by the production performance of his offsprings in, proper, in a properly conducted, in properly conducted uh, progeny tests. Uh, the production performance of the daughters is actual proof of the transmitting ability of the bull. Because, uh, you know, when, when selecting bulls, more so on, on sire, sire studs or the bull studs, okay? Selection is dependent on, on the performance of the offsprings or the daughters of this bull, okay? They, they collect semen out of this bull, synchronize the daughters of the bull, in different regions of, of maybe a country, serve them, uh, rear them to, 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 to calving time. These, these animals produce, and then they start recording milk performance of those different daughters. And this performance is, is like, could, could be on, on a number of bulls. You could have, for example, you could have 10 bulls that are being evaluated, and out of the 10 bulls, you're looking for the best performer. So based on the performance of the, of the daughters, uh, is, uh, th that will uh, direct you on uh, which bull you should consider for introduction on your farm as the serving sire. So problem sire method is a self-evaluation method. Then you also have pedigree selection. Pedigree selection is dependent or is based on performance of the parents and grandparents. So, usually pedigree selection is for young bulls, bulls that are, uh, haven't attained that stage of, or that age of breeding. We, we base their selection on performance of the lineage of the parents and grand or great grandparents. So when you're choosing a bull, these are the factors that you need to look at. To start with is the, the bull's appearance. You're looking out for the medium to large sized bulls because that has a direct correlation on performance of the offsprings. You're looking at the testicles of the bull and these should be symmetrical and near of the same size and freely movable in the, scr in the scrotum. And uh, there are three basic uh, scrotal shapes, okay? We have the normal 
au botoshift momo botoshift au pendulum shape uh, type of scrutum i don't know what shapes we have huh? you i saw you have an interest in, in in the other picture what are the shapes we are told no more should it is no more when it is pendulum shaped or bottle shaped so you can check yourself also <laughs> then uh, we are also told that bulls with with straight straight sided scrotums are only moderate if you have if you are choosing a bull with almost straight shaped uh, uh, testicles then you actually should know that these are uh, uh, middle or medium performers okay the straight sided neck of the scrotum is generally, is generally the result of fat deposits that may impair proper thermal regulation because you need space above the testicles to regulate temperature of the testis remember spermatozoa is stored in the testis isn't it so if you have a fatty tissue surrounding remember uh, uh, fat is highly sensitive to to heat okay so these tes testicles being surrounded by fat tissue that fat tissue affects uh, quality of the spermatozoa because it will always fluctuate uh, the temperature of uh, the testicles then we also don't want wedge shaped scrotums because bulls with this kind of scrotal configuration have undersized testicles and seldom produce semen of adequate quality which shape do we have wedge shaped huh? or the normal shape you need to check yourself because we are, to we are told that if it is wedge shaped if it is well shaped, what happens? Seldom produce what? Semen of adequate quality. So you might be blaming the female, and yet the problem is where? Is the male. So this is the kind of scrotal shape that we need. Pendulum or bottle shaped. Okay? This space is very important in regulating temperature in this area because this is where we keep or this is where the animal keeps the what the spermatozoa or the sperms here so any fluctuations in temperature here if this moves closer to the body yeah we still have a few minutes so this is the shape that we talked about full of fatty issue fatty tissue eh? up or well shape okay we don't want bulls having these kinds of shapes operationalization of the dial enterprise having looked at all the different factors that we have discussed then you need now to consider how you're going to operationalize your enterprise and in order to produce high quality milk at a profit there has to be consistent operation there has to be consistent operations of all the systems on the farm their farm success depends on how well these systems work together to produce large volumes of milk remember as a dairy entrepreneur you need to produce every liter of milk at the lowest cost possible and the lowest cost, cost possible is is uh, um, is achieved or realized by proper balancing of the different systems that are affecting production at the farm and we are told or oh, we uh, need to look at these three systems the uh, feeding the cow system or the nutritional program very critical you need to always find ways of minimizing on on the feeding costs milk harvesting whatever you invest in in terms of milk handling and 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 and, uh, and storage is very important and then health and reproduction management 